Welcome everyone to the stream. I'm here with Haya Heather and Mason Hurston Horde of the Institute for Social Ecology. Um, Haya Heller is a writer, activist, anthropologist, and artist who has been teaching political and feminist theory at the Institute for Social Ecology for nearly four decades. Haya has been active in movements ranging from ecofeminism and the left greens to the global justice movement, Occupy and BLM. Haya is the author of The Ecology of Everyday Life from Black Rose Books and Food Farms and Solidarity from Duke University Press. And Mason is a writer and community organizer in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, he works there organizing bus riders to fight for better public transit and organizing his neighbors to build direct democracy in their community. He's a member of Symbiosis and Detroit Build and Fight. His work has been published by The Next System Project, The Ecologist, uh, in These Times, Social Forum, Harbinger, Perspectives on Anarchist Theory, and the Journal of World Systems Research. So thank you both so much for, for coming on the show. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Awesome. Um, well, maybe maybe to start, would you like to um, just speak a bit about the Institute and the kind of work being done there? You want to take that, Haya? You want me to take that? Okay. <laughs> the Institute for Social Ecology was founded in 1972 at Goddard College by Dan Chorikoff and Murray Bookchin. And basically during those decades between the 70s and now, we've been offering um, what we call popular education, which is, means accessibly education that's accessible to people who are coming from um, a range of different backgrounds that the idea is that you should be able to walk off the street and understand what we're saying. And we try to, we try to do that. We try to make our, our work accessible. And our mission as a school has been really to inform activists and scholars who are related to different um, movements that have been around since the 70s. And so the ISC emerged in the midst of the um, anti-nuclear movement, new social movements, which were there was too many to a name and the ecology movement in particular. And um, every literally five to 10 years, the mission shifts to address what new sets of circumstances we're finding ourselves in both, you know, nationally and internationally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, There's 36 years, but Mason represents the youth of the, of the organization. So we can speak to being a younger person in the ISC. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think um, one of the one of the roles it's been serving in recent years is being sort of a, an intellectual hub for um, people experimenting with new forms of assembly democracy. I think a lot of us like were kind of politicized into um, this um, this approach to politics through Occupy or um, or related events um, in the 2010s, and um, I think having having the ISC as kind of this um, institution of um, kind of like passing on movement knowledge and um, you know helping helping younger generations think through the problems that we've been encountering and. Um, and to build on those ideas with our own practice has been um, really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's incredibly important. Um, and I love that the Institute exists as a place that that is doing that. Um, Waffle to the left says, happy belated 100th, 100th birthday, Bookchin. So <laughs> happy belated, yeah, Bookchin. We had a birthday party for him, about 10 of us. Oh, really? That's yeah, awesome. Um, Marie's um, former wife, B. Bookchin, and Debbie Bookchin, and people who are just close friends of Murray's, we, we toasted him and, and kind of went around and, and shared our first, our favorite memories with Murray. Oh, that's so amazing. Um, if you'd like to share your favorite memory, uh, you can go ahead, but if it's personal, that's totally fine. I have many that are personal, but I, the one that I shared last night was that um, when I stumbled kind of accidentally upon the ISC, I was 21 and I had been studying philosophy in college and I remember it was so frustrating that my teachers wouldn't kind of position themselves, you know, mm -hmm. in relation to the thinkers that we were studying. So they were teaching Marx. I had no idea were they Marxists. I had no idea if we were studying Heidegger, were they, you know, what were their, where they stood. And so, and I was fighting, I was really involved in the anti-apartheid movement in, in college. And so when I stumbled upon the ISC, 
and I met Murray like the first day that I was there, I sat down and I was able to have a conversation with a real live philosopher who was completely politically committed, engaged, positioned. And it was so cool to go through all of the different theorists that I've been studying and to hear his take on them and to finally have somebody to say, yeah, philosophy is very political um, mm -hmm. and everybody's theory is political. And if you're teaching a, a theory, you should be able to answer to your students and say what you think about that theory. Yeah, yeah. So that's a really, you know, for me, it was just meeting this man that had committed his life to trying to break down theory for folks um, to make them come alive and be meaningful in the context of changing the world. And, and I'll just say that, you know, Murray was an autodidact and a lot of times people refer to him as an academic and that would probably make his blood boil because he's, he literally, I think just finished high school. He worked in foundries and he was a labor organizer. He is, was completely self-taught. He had no formal um, secondary education whatsoever. And he didn't teach in the university except for a couple of years in the seventies at the university of New Jersey. And he couldn't take it, <laughs> mm -hmm. he stopped. but he was, he was really an, an unusual man with, with an encyclopedic brain. Mm -hmm. and he's very generous. In spirit. Yeah. That's so amazing. It must've been just so wonderful to know him and, and to meet him and to have that influence. Um, and you're right. Philosophy is always political and uh, it should, should never be treated otherwise. Um, so the first question I have is just, you know, for anyone who is not familiar with what social ecology is, I know this is a huge question. I was just saying off stream that I just watched uh, or I just listened to Seriously Wrong's three-part series on uh, social ecologies featuring you uh, and other people from the, the Institute. Um, but if you could give us kind of a breakdown, um, what is social ecology or, or, you know, lead us through some of the tenets of social ecological theory? Um, what does it mean to be a social ecologist? And what is the relevance of social ecology for our current moment? Do you, Do you want me to start off? I can take a stab and then maybe you can fill in anything that you think is important that's been missed. Okay. Um, so I would say that um, social ecology is a philosophy that amounts to a whole system of thought, but I think we can distill it down to three core ideas that are kind of the foundation. Um, the first is that human beings and human society are not separate from nature. We are biological beings, we are outcomes and parts of the process of natural evolution of life just as much as any other species. Um, and even if we talk about um, the evolution of human society or social evolution, um, that needs to be understood as being nested within um, the wider biological process um, of, of, of change through natural history. Um, I, th I think the second core idea is that the destructive role we have played in the relatively recent years of our species history uh, is therefore not a result of anything innately destructive about human beings, but of the hierarchical structure of our societies as they have developed historically. Um, it's the social relations of domination and exploitation within human society that lead to environmental destruction. Um, another way that that can put really simply is um, that ecological problems are social problems. Um, that means that under overcome um, the the hierarchies within human society in order to um, to resolve them. Um, and so that leads to lastly. Um, kind of the conclusion from that is um, that the only pathway to an ecologically healthy world um, is therefore through social revolution that overturns all human hierarchies um, and that only direct democracy can reharmonize human society um, with the rest of the web of life. And I think those three um, like core insights are kind of like the, the base layer of um, social ecological thought. Um, obviously, there's like a lot more than that um, that's kind of built on top of um, of those ideas, but I think those are the, the basics. Mm -hmm. I might just add that 
<clears throat> that was that was really great. <clears throat> Excuse me. That to really sorry <clears throat> to really understand Bookchin's project of social ecology, putting it in the history, locating him in history in relationship to Marx is really important because he was raised as a Marxist. His parents were Russian socialists who came to the U.S. and he was literally born and raised in the Communist Party. And for Bookchin, you know, if, you, if that is your formation, then your central sort of unit of inquiry is class and the proletariat are the revolutionary subjects and the revolutionary sphere is the factory floor. And so for Bookchin, when he you know, by the 50s or so, had really kind of come to some conclusions looking at what was the, you know, the, the brimmings of the, the, the emerging civil rights movement that really kind of started to percolate in the 60s. He really started to understand the limitations of Marxism to explain um, the kinds of social revolution and social revolt that were unfolding in the 60s that you Marx couldn't explain that the university with people who had more than enough to eat who are not workers or um, people who were fighting for civil rights people of color um, who are not fighting as workers so he realized that the revolutionary subject needed to be broadened and that class and capitalism couldn't completely explain the problems that we were the source of the problems we were having and that so he broadened out the critique of capitalism and class to really be a critique of social hierarchy in general. And he saw the revolutionary project to be broader than just controlling the means of production. Um, he thought you have to go further and really control the political means of production to become citizens in the most broadest um, sense that have a direct relationship to a democratic process. So. It's, it's important to know that Bookchin was really a post-Marxist who was dancing with Marx. He, he was a Marxist who, who had a really active dynamic relationship to Marx. And you see Marx all over his theory, um, but he goes beyond what Marx could do by really bringing the problem, um, highlighting it as a political problem and one that requires a directly democratic society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I guess uh, just the end, the tail end of that. Um, so uh, what, what would you say the relevance is of social ecology for this current moment? Every, everything. everything. <laughs> I say that because like Marxism, social ecology, books in social ecology and his communalist project is really um, a universal and very generalized theory that individual people working in specific movements and moments can and can particularize in their local context. So, you know, right now, if we were to say, what are the most horrifying things that are happening right now? Well, we can't name them, but let's just say, you know, we're seeing the worst, most egregious effects of late capitalism. We're seeing its effect in the pandemic, um, in eco ecological destruction, in poverty and in inequality and just and ecological devastation around the planet. And we're seeing the, the experiments in democracy, you know, that are happening in the United States and Canada and in Europe, we're seeing them be mightily challenged. And I think if, even if we just look at capitalism, the environment and experiments in democracy, I think that social ecology has a lot to say to all three problems. Mm -hmm. um, again, Bookchin says we have to swap out the capitalist system for a moral economy. We have to swap out a representative electoral um, democracy um, for a directly democratic um, political sphere. And we have to have an ecological society that cares about humans and the rest of the natural world. Mm -hmm. I think that um, a, like a number of those basic insights of social ecology have um, in a really positive way become more generalized as kind of uh, a radical left common sense in a way that was really not the case when he was writing. Um, I think specifically the ecological critique of capitalism, um, even if like people who now espouse it don't necessarily know where it originated from. Um, and that's such a huge change from the, you know, productivist and often like overtly anti-ecological tendencies of the Marxist left um, of the 20th century. 
Um, and I think like understanding the um, ecological dimensions of capitalism is, um, is the central theoretical necessity of us surviving the 21st century and responding to these crises effectively. Um, and and think, I think this kind of analysis is really essential for um, helping liberals and progressives make like better sense of what we need to do to respond to climate change. Mm -hmm. um, I think for the most part, um, they understand it as being about changing an economic practice as just a simple matter of switching from oil and coal to solar and wind. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, social ecology can be really helpful for helping people make sense and help them grasp that these problems instead lie with our social relations of domination and exploitation um, and that we're, we're never going to be able to halt or reverse the ecological crisis without, um, without transforming those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really well said. I mean, especially for uh, climate change and, you know, the ecological crises that we're looking at in the next few decades. Um, I've said before on videos that it's not enough to just democratize um, production, right? It's not enough to control the means of production if we're not actually radically uh, transforming the way that we even conceptualize production and consumption and um, living in reciprocity with our environments, right? Like that still would be um, unsustainable. Um, so my next question is, um, as you mentioned, you know, Bookshin notes that societies can be classless, but can remain hierarchical in a number of other ways. Um, and remaining hierarchical can, um, you know, still impede people's freedom within those societies. Um, so could you discuss how social ecology treats, treats the concepts of hierarchy and freedom um, and how these relate to the ecological realm? Sure. You want to take that? <laughs> So <clears throat> the question about hierarchy is just, is just so interesting that, you know, as Mason was just saying, when I entered the movement in the early 80s, I was blown away that being an ecology, an ecologically oriented person was considered really bourgeois because the idea was that all of our oppression stemmed from capitalism. And if we just got rid of class, we just liberated the proletariat, all of the problems, including maybe ecological problems would go away because sort of a reasonable socialist, eventually stateless socialist society would would, re, would appear. And Bookchin said, no, um, what, eradicating one particular form of hierarchy does not in any way lead to a domino effect of putting pulling down other forms of hierarchy. You could get rid of um, capitalism and still have the world that we had before capitalism. You know, if you look at human history, we had the state is now six to 8,000 years old. Um, we, people lived in very hierarchical, stratified, um, feudalistic formations with, with slaves and all kinds of um, things that today we would not accept at all. So clearly just getting rid of um, class or capitalism is not going to free us. We could still have identity-based oppression, um, ways of dehumanizing people because of the way they are racialized or um, seen as in, um, having an ethnicity that's not appreciated. We'd still have white um, supremacy, we could be alive and well. We can have patriarchy and we can have heteronormativity. So there's no domino effect. And Bookchin was, that was a radical thing to say in the 50s and 60s that to have to actually, it made him become at first an anarchist because anarchy, anarchism literally means without hierarchy, without rule over. Um, and so Bookchin had decided, I'm going to build this new theory within an anarchist, social anarchist framework. Um, and when I came into the movement in the 80s, that was considered kind of like, you know, crazy. And for it to have to be anarchist and ecological for the Marxists was, was kind of crazy. Um, and so hierarchy, again, you know, for Bookchin, it's created by humans to be used against other humans and then humans project a hierarchical view of the world onto how they look at the rest of um, the natural world so we then see hierarchies in the bees and in ants and in the lobsters uh, you know we, lobsters. we project hierarchy everywhere and and doing that then normalizes and naturalizes and makes human hierarchy seem totally natural and inevitable 
And then just to briefly touch on the question of freedom, Bookshop, I think is unique in that he really wanted to not just show, to give a history of hierarchy within human history, but he wanted to give a natural history to the idea of freedom, which is kind of groundbreaking. He wanted to say that the idea of freedom, not the idea, but the phenomena of freedom actually exists with the beginning of organic life on this planet. So the, with the first unicellular organisms, the fact that they have what he would call nascent subjectivity, not that they're choosing or reasoning or thinking um, in the ways that other animals do as you move through evolution, but they're not machines and they're not also subject to laws of physics. There's something different um, that a unicellular or organism has it's, that makes it different from an atom and how an atom um, behaves, but it doesn't, it's not also the same as a human being. But Bookchin looks at the emergence, the gradual emergence or unfolding of subjectivity, consciousness, and freedom. And he uses those words kind of coterminously. So he looks at the emergence of this, this phenomenon, this unfolding of mind, of consciousness, as we move through natural evolution. And when humans emerge, we are um, nature renders self-conscious. We are a different kind of, we have a different potential for freedom um, as human beings. And his whole project rests on the idea that humans have the potential to create a, a free nature um, in which they are able to formalize freedom institutionally by creating um, liberatory institutions. And that would be by creating um, a direct democracy, a moral economy, um, an ecological technology, a charter that um, defines what is what I call restorative humanism. Um, and that freedom for Bookchin is a historical, natural phenomena, as well as a concept that humans think and talk about and design our movements around. And it has an equal, has a, I mean, I just think it's just such a poetic and lovely thing that freedom began before humans knew what it was and could name it once they started to be unfree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Mason, did you want to add anything to that? No, I'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's wonderful. Um, I guess as I kind of understand it, right, like as you said, you know, a lot of um, humans and specifically uh, people who are very invested in maintaining the status quo will look to nature and say, oh, we see hierarchy there um, and therefore that naturalizes our hierarchy and whatnot. Um, but that actually there isn't really a hierarchy in nature, right? Like there's networks, um, you know, there's food webs, there's reciprocity. Um, I think a lot of this, I think and maybe you can speak to this, that Bookchin took a lot from indigenous philosophies um, that are based more around, you know, the idea of humans as just one part of uh, the rest of an ecosystem and that, you know, imagines a positive role for humans to play within that ecosystem. And I kind of view that as as freedom, right? Like just being able to like vibe with nature and, you know, <laughs> And to basically just be part of that broader system um, and not, you know, subject to the, this ridiculous idea of work under capitalism. Uh, right. I mean, yeah. another part of the concept of freedom for Bookchin is that humans become free when we're free to be called, to be what um, Aristotle called Zoom politicon, political animals, that when we can actually use technology to free ourselves from toil and have time to just enjoy life, but also to be engaging in politics. And for mm -hmm. him, that meant actively being involved, maybe in a daily or weekly basis in your local municipal assemblies. And mm -hmm. that that was part of what humans, that's, that, that, that's part of the human set of potentialities that make us, us free. Mm -hmm. And he felt that until we have a free nature that can be politically free, um, it'll be really hard to live. We, in his mind, you can't have an ecological society until humans are free to create an ecological society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was wondering if you could explain the concepts of usufruct, complementarity, and the irreducible minimum, um, and how these relate to a social ecological future. 
Sure, I'm an anthropologist, so this is it's fun because you know Murray was really excited by anthropology, and he mostly was reading anthropology. When he wrote *The Ecology of Freedom*, where you see the most anthropology in his work, he was reading '70s um, ethnographic um, writings by kind of radical um, many many people who are actually anthropologists who are influenced by Marx were doing kind of really interesting research in the '70s. So Murray was fascinated that this is true that um, if you look at the human record, um, we've been a species, a modern homo sapiens sapien species for about 150,000 years. And that capitalism emerged 500 years. So that's 0.333% of the time that we've been humans have we been living in a capitalist society. So the reason it's important to understand these concepts is that for many people, the idea that mo that for Let's go back for most of human history, let's say 99% of human history, human beings lived in small bands that were 60 to 90 people. Often they would aggregate together and be kind of like a confederation that would share, they'd come together for feasts and festivals, et cetera. Um, but the main organizing that we would call economic principles that they organized their social lives around was the idea of the irreducible minimum. And you see this in, in every egalitarian society. And again, when I use that term, I'm not saying it's silly non-hierarchical because there could have been, um, as Bookshin feels, some nascent forms of hierarchy, but they were egalitarian in that everybody in the band had access to the same tools, goods, and food, and um, the same goods. So the irreducible minimum is simply the concept that everyone, again, has access to what they need to um, live and be and be good um, in their society. And, and when I would teach anthropology, you know, intro to anthro, it was always amazing to watch people's eyes kind of like almost pop out of their heads to think, what? <laughs> like, that's, that's the 99% of our history, we live that way. And it's kind of like amazing that people who were seen as hoarding or greedy were seen as Antisocial and actually were were penalized and were um, shunned. That was seen as very dangerous behavior um, to the group. So that's the irreducible minimum that mm -hmm. nobody goes without, um, and that things are um, divided up equally. Um, the idea of use of fruct is simply the concept that there is no ownership of anything um, unless you're using that thing. So that if I'm using um, an instrument or a drum or some kind of technology that we're sharing together, it's mine during the time that I'm using it. Uh, this doesn't mean that people didn't have possessions that were personal and private. Um, there's in the anthropological record shows that people put a lot of care in making little boots for their children and beautiful, with beautiful beadwork and for their each other and made beautiful jewelry and clothing. So it doesn't mean that people didn't have private possessions, but it means that there was no wealth um, that people owned privately or objects that they owned privately that were, that, that, that were very meaningful and purposeful that only one person would have access to. And the next concept, what, what was the third one? Um, complementarity. The, having a moral economy based on the principle of complementarity means that people's needs and their abilities are seen as being not in conflict with one another, but can actually complement each other. That as we get older, we might not be able to do a lot of the hard, heavy lifting that we did when we were younger, but we can complement that by having wisdom and stories and knowledge um, and skills that people have, there can be complementarity between the sexes. There seems to be a, um, a sexual division of labor that is pretty global. People did it really different in different cultures and different bands and, and societies in different parts of the planet. And it wasn't always broken down around sex. It's, there's evidence that many times women went to join the hunt with men and that men did some gathering, that there's a lot more sex gender fluidity in, a, in many small hunting, hunting gathering societies. But the, the principle here is that, again, instead of people having an antagonistic relationship to each other within the economic sphere, 
it was it was really one based on mutualism, solidarity, and people sort of filling each other out and complementing each other, again, rather than having inherently conflicting um, interests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, did you want to add anything uh, to that, Mason? Um, I think um, I had a thought on the usufruct, but I think I'll hold it. Okay. <laughs> Oh, feel free to say it if you'd like. <laughs> well, I, I kind of lost it when I was listening okay. to Maya. Um, no I'll, worries. I'll reorganize it. Um, what you were saying about um, the irreducible minimum uh, reminded me of Robin Wall Kimmerer's work. Um, uh, she talks about, um, you know, uh, indigenous, uh, well, the Potawatomi, she's uh, Potawatomi, um, and she was talking about how, um, yeah, in the tradition of, of her culture, um, it was, as you said, you know, considered to be really um, dangerous for people to actually hoard wealth, or that was actually looked down upon. Um, and the 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 way that you actually expressed or showed other people how wealthy you were um, was by giving it away, <laughs> um, uh, and that was kind of a, a mark of status. If you had enough to give away and to help everyone else, then that was actually a mark of status. Um, so it just really shows you that there's so many different ways that we can organize the way that we live and that we relate to one another and to the natural world. Um, but again, you know, we're stuck in this very capitalist mindset where a lot of people will just say that like this hierarchical um, and specifically this capitalist relation of production is just human nature, <laughs> um, which is ridiculous. As you said, it's just a small, small part of the the wide history of, of all of human history, right? Um, three, three, three percent. Yeah. Yeah, so. I did um, find my, my thought. Oh, great. Um, just, just I wanted to look, contrast um, a, a bit further how usufruct differs from private property and how like our conceptions of, of property are, are really such a, a historically recent phenomenon. So, I mean, we normally think of property as a relationship between ourselves and the thing that we own. Um, but that's that's kind of um, not the case at all. Um, like in in the Western world, and you know the trajectory of, of European law around private property, um, mostly all traces back to Roman property law, which was like actually very clear that property is a relationship between people, not between people and their stuff. And to have private ownership over something means that you get to prevent other people from making use of it. Mm -hmm. um and the um it's, it's just a fundamentally different way of relating between human beings um that you know is 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 the root of a lot of <laughs> a lot of our problems and um by reframing our our social relationships around um things being uh valued to the community based on their use rather than um preventing others from making use of them um, is is kind of the foundation of um, use of fruct is a is a totally different organizing principle and um, one that's kind of the bedrock of um, you know all kinds of socialist and proto socialist thought more broadly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like the framing of that as private property being just preventing other people from making use of things. Because um, there's these memes, I don't know, I, I've seen like memes going around about, um, you know, the first person who invented private property. Um, and it's like basically <laughs> just this guy who like walks out and into the middle of nature and is like, yep, I own this. I think I own this now. Um, and then what does it mean to own it? Well, uh, it just means that I'm going to get a bunch of guns. And if anyone comes on this area, I'm going to shoot them or I'm going to get them off, right? You know, so that's basically what it means. Uh, private property means, um, and framing it that way, I think, is really like uh, uh, illustrative. Um, yeah. And that goes back to you know, Proudhon and private property is theft. Yes, um, yes. is the the kind of thing that like helps shake us out of our assumptions about what it is. Yeah, you know, an example that's really useful for people when when I when I would teach students about sort of the non-history or prehistory of capitalism, which is almost all human history, is that we don't even, you know, blink before we think about going to a library. The library is usufruct. You walk mm -hmm. in, you sign out the book, you use the book, you enjoy the book, and you bring it back for somebody else to use and enjoy. And in socialized, countries where there's socialized medicine, um, you go to a hospital, and you use medical equipment and medical services while you're there, you're on that bed if you need to be in a bed. 
and then when you're done using it, you go home. So we have, there are still moments and instances and vestiges of pre-capitalism or uncapitalism within capitalist societies that are still there. And I think reminding people of those is a really great thing. And, and just the last one I love is that I think in, um, in Amsterdam, I don't know if they're still doing it, but there's this thing where you can take a bicycle that's been set up for this purpose, ride that bike for a certain amount of time, leave it at a station when you're done, lock it up and or whatever. And then somebody else comes by and takes that book and it's bike sharing. Mm -hmm. And so people, people are, oh yeah like you know it becomes so obviously and so conspicuously possible that you start to maybe doubt does capitalism have to be the, the totalizing force that it is mm -hmm. yeah absolutely i was going to mention that that there are a lot of moves towards you know this kind of solidarity or sharing economy but in the actual true sense of it not in terms of like the gig economy uh which is what it's often called um but they have some things like that in Toronto or, you know, places where it's like you can rent tools and you don't actually need, um, you know, to own the tools or whatnot. Um, we do have bike sharing, but it is like you have to pay for it. So it is, I guess, still embedded in capital. It's not fully shared. But um, I think there's a lot of people who are trying to start to, to you know, grow more networks like this where things would be shared and we wouldn't need to um, create so much useless crap <laughs> uh, and destroy the environment doing it. Um, so Chaya, uh, I, this is directed towards you, but Mason, um, you can also feel free to, uh, to respond if you have some thoughts on this. Um, I know that a lot of your work, uh, uses, you know, feminist critique and that you taught a course around feminism and ecology for many years at ISE. Um, so how does social ecology bring feminist insight to bear on social and ecological problems? Well, femi yeah, I taught feminism, I taught a course called, um, Social Perspectives on Women and Ecology for 22 years um, at the ISC. And um, it was one of the most popular classes, um, not necessarily because I was teaching it, but a lot of people, particularly in the 80s and 90s, came to the ISC to study ecofeminism because it really wasn't being taught outside of the ISC all that much. Um, it was just starting to percolate out into academia. But, you know, for Bookshin, Identity-based oppression is really central. Patriarchy is a central problem of hierarchy. So, um, but he also felt that he was not the person to write about what it's like to be a woman and to write feminist theory. He was very, in the 60s, he was very excited by the feminist movement. Um, and he was very excited about feminism and feminist theory. And so I sh started teaching um, Eco it was called Ecofeminism for short, the class in 84. And the main sort of organizing principle for the class over the 22 years was that you can't have an ecological society free of hierarchy if women are not liberated and that women have to do that work of consciousness raising um, and not just as a group, but as different women with, um, now we call it intersectionality, women with intersecting multiple contradictory identities, um, that, that people who identify as women, and again, Scott, it's, what, what that means now in 2021 is really different than what it meant in 1984, mm -hmm. um, but that women who, people who identify as women had to sort of think about what does ecology mean to us? And, and, and ecofeminist theory is literally a continued meditation on what are the articulations between feminism and ecology and essentially they broke down there were sort of two camps and one camp kind of was a little bit essentialist thinking that well women we're closer to nature because we menstruate and um we give birth and we we um feed our babies with our bodies etc um and i was i was a social ecofeminist um and i was in this movement and I would try to make the case for women aren't more don't have bodies that are more natural or closer to nature than men because mm -hmm. nobody's closer to nature than than anybody else because we're all part of nature. So the women mm -hmm. nature thing didn't you know we, I, I would sort of unpack that and and have people look at that critically. So that was part of ecofeminism was unpacking that women nature thing. But then to say is there something about 
women's um, roles as um, essential to what Marx would call reproduction, reproductive labors. So the um, child birthing and the rearing and the food production and the, food, the, and the feeding and the food processing and um, being the herbalists and the healers in the society so that, and, the, and then the agriculturalists so that these, these, these kinds of roles that women do through their work and their practices in society end up having ecological meaning only in that, only if we look at that in that way. And I say that because in, until you, in the 80s and 90s, unless you said explicitly ecofeminism, people didn't think about women when they thought about ecology or environmentalism. If, if women were not the ecological subject. Mm -hmm. um, the subject was just, the default subject was, was really a white man. But to say that the ecological subject was also black and brown women all over the planet who are doing 80% of the agricultural work and are also on the receiving end of most of the ecological crisis, um, mm -hmm. either by having toxics dumped um, in, in indigenous lands or in um, communities of color where people are poor and have little ability to defend themselves, um, that women all around that international fem uh, feminism became increasingly ecologically minded. And so the ecofeminist movement through the 90s really became an international feminist kind of intervention where women were like, hey, we're already at the, at the head of a lot of these movements to save forests because we, we live and work in the forest. For, you know, we get our food from the forest or we're at the head of these agricultural movements. We're at the head of these environmental movements because our, our communities are getting poisoned and we're trying to protect our children. So mm -hmm. that sort of the ecofeminist, you know, project has that so those the sort of two um, facets to it, but, but they're entirely central to social ecology. And um, to me, I can't imagine being a social ecologist and not being a feminist and, mm -hmm. and to not understanding the project as being entirely feminist. But the last thing I want to say is that the term ecofeminism was a linguistic intervention that was really important, again, to put the spotlight on women and give women a platform in the 80s and 90s and 2000s um, to talk from the experience and perspective as women in the same way that naming environmental racism was really, really important and continues to be really important. That it was really important in the anti-toxics movement that was called the environmental justice movement. Then in the 80s, people started talking about environmental racism. And when that happened, all of a sudden, the ecological subject was now a black and brown person. Whereas mm -hmm. before, the ecological subject was always a white man. Now mm -hmm. it's somebody living in an urban center who's having their water poisoned, like in the lead crisis in Detroit. But we start to understand that how you are racialized affects the way you are hit by ecological um, catastrophe, not just mm -hmm. how you're sexed, but how you're racialized and where you sit in the human hierarchy affects how you're going to experience the ecological crisis. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, yeah. I, think I think that, that sorry, I'm hearing an echo. Oh, no, it's gone. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that, um, you know, the the insights of feminism, as you've said, like have have so much to um, bring to bear on, uh, you know, the eco ecological problems that we're facing, um, just in terms of, you know, connecting the dots between um, patriarchy and um, the devastation of the environment and also the oppression of, uh, of women or non-men. Um, I think that a good example of that would be like man camps um, in, uh, you know, indigenous territories where they are, you know, bulldozing through um, creating pipelines or whatnot on indigenous lands without their consent. And there are often these kind of man camps that are created as a result of that. And those end up, um, you know, perpetuating sexual violence and gender-based violence against indigenous women. Um, and then, you know, indigenous women being often at the forefront of, um, uh, you know, uh, land protection, um, the, you know, water protectors and things like that. So um, I think that's kind of a good way of connecting the dots for people. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's a really well said and um, really important intervention. Um, Mason, did you have anything to add? Um, I just want to also note that um, in the actual social revolutions that have accompanied this kind of 
um, anti-hierarchical, ecological, um, revolutionary struggles. Um, the ones that have succeeded have brought women's oppression to the forefront. I'm thinking specifically of um, the Kurdish movement in northern Syria and as well as um, the Zapatistas in southern Mexico, Absolutely. where um, there's like a, a clear recognition of how oppression within the family as like the basic unit of patriarchy um, helps sustain and um, feed the other kinds of repression that um, they were trying to overcome. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the, the ways in which like just the basic social relations of family life have been transformed for ordinary people who participate in these struggles, um, I think has been uh, simply extraordinary. And um, I, think, I think that has to be the way that we um, understand feminist struggle in relation to in, in relation to these wider problems because mm -hmm. it's not it's not just about being um, tangled up in the, the various forms that oppression relates to itself but also um, in the various ways that liberation relates to itself mm -hmm. yeah that's yeah. really really well said um because yeah it's, it's true it's i guess easier to mount a critique than to actually put forward a positive vision for the future and that's one thing that i love about social ecology and like communalism is that it does actually present not only a negative critique of what we don't want but puts forward a positive um, vision of what liberation could look like and all the ways that different intersecting oppressions um feed into that and i'm glad you brought up um white supremacy as well because um that's another just very obvious um system of oppression that has damaged uh the environment while also um you know completely uh oppressing and subjugating people of color um, and colonized peoples the world over um so my next question is uh how can we avoid replicating or reinforcing this kind of uh, appeal to nature fallacy when talking about social ecology um especially around like hierarchy and nature and like what is natural um like we said a lot of people um you know like jordan peterson and other elite people will uh kind of look to nature and um say oh because we see this in nature or because we think we see this in nature um that legitimizes uh what we're doing as humans um i just what are your thoughts on that uh, want me to go first? i i would just say that like one of the one of the central um the central thing like aspects of how social ecologists look at nature and human social evolution is that these things are developmental processes, that they're the most uh, central component of their, what makes them that thing is uh, a continual process of change. There is no, there is no static nature um, of anything and certainly not of um, human beings or human societies. And um, I think it's what's really crucial uh, to bring forward is that one of the things that makes um, humans um, really interesting as a species is the capacity for, their, for them to reorganize their society in any number of different ways. Um, there, is no, there is no single organizational principle for how human beings relate to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of that um, inherent um, uh, mutable nature, of human society forces us to make collective choices about what we want it to be, um, and you know, there is there is no um, static, single, natural social order that we can refer back to um, or deviate from. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, it's an inherently dynamic um, uh, social reality. Mm -hmm. Just to piggyback on, you know, what Mason just said so eloquently is that, you know, like Peter Kropotkin, and it's funny because Bookchin didn't read Peter Kropotkin while he was developing his nature philosophy. It wasn't translated into English until mm -hmm. after he generated most of his ideas. But it's not a coincidence that these two men who were anarchists had a really similar read on nature. And, you know, we're all living in the shadow of not necessarily Darwinism, but social 
social Darwinism or Spencerian social Darwinism that leads to a really vulgar sociobiology where, like I said, was saying earlier, that every social relationship is, is lawful because you find its antecedent in nature, that you know, nature is, is um, inherently greedy and withholding and um, it's a realm of conflict and, and um, competition. Thus, society must be that. So, you know, when Bookchin, you know, he absolutely was writing to sociobiologists when he wrote The Ecology of Freedom. That was, you know, a love letter <laughs> to sociobiologists saying no. And, and in his previous writing saying, no, no, we have to understand, not just redefine nature, but really understand what is nature. It's not, again, a, you know, a picture frame photograph. It's a process. Mm -hmm. of evolution that starts with the first unicellular organisms and goes all the way till right now. It's all of it. Mm -hmm. But for Bookchin, he doesn't believe that there's um, any set of natural laws that determine that process, but instead there are sets of potentialities. Mm -hmm. um, and there's in, in humanity, for instance, we have the potential to become conscious and cooperative and mutualistic and complementary, but we also have, the, he would use the word possibility, to create horrible, heinous um, hierarchies and to be really fiercely antisocial. So Bookchin is not um, invoking a nature and using that nature to normalize the society. And, and, and the naturalistic fallacy is basically saying X is, is, is good because it's natural and it's natural because it's from nature. Mm -hmm. and, it's a it's a, a, a philosophical fallacy and mm -hmm. Bookchin leaves that by redefining what nature is it's a dynamic historical process of, of unfolding that's never ending mm -hmm. and has no determinable laws that are governing it um, and that humans can play a conscious decisive role in how that nature continues to unfold or ceases to be mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's reflected in, um, you know, ecology uh, or conservation biology as well, right? This idea that um, we don't have, like, the idea of equilibrium is, we've kind of moved away from that and to understand, you know, natural processes as being just marked by chaos and disequilibrium and, you know, change and things like that. So, um, yeah, that was really well said. Um, so I wanted to ask this question about animal agriculture. Uh, it's something that I talk about a lot. Um, and when we talk about dismantling hierarchies, I think that speciesism is a hierarchy that often gets um, ignored or, or erased. And I mean, like institutionalized speciesism. Um, so I'm wondering how meat eating fits into this broader social ecological future, because um, as we know, you know, animal agriculture is completely unsustainable. And even if we move towards, you know, smaller scale farms or kind of grass fed production, um, we still wouldn't be able to satisfy a typical North American diet that way because we eat so much meat in North America and we just don't have the land space for that. So outside of like widespread and rapid advancement in lab grown meat um, to be able to feed everyone uh, the level of meat and animal products that they eat currently, we would need to continue animal agriculture. Um, so to my mind, there would need to be like a radical reduction um, in the amount of meat and animal products being consumed in a, in a sustainable social ecological future. But I'm wondering uh, what your, your thoughts are on that. I can, I can offer that. some, oh, go for it. Should I go? What were you saying? <laughs> okay, I can, I can go first. So, um, well, first I just wanna preface by saying that this is a question about which there is nothing resembling common ground among social ecologists. Um, it's uh, often a, a heated debate um, among among social ecologists, but um, so I'm just speaking for myself personally here. Um, but um, I do think that we need to um, integrate um, an analysis of domination of non-human animals into the wider conception of hierarchy and um, and its ecological impacts. Um, that domination on human animals obviously plays a really central role in unraveling our local and global ecology. Um, and domination of animals is interwoven 
with our domination of each other um, in so many different ways. Um, this can even be um, analyzed historically, um, given that it seems that in certain um, places, the domestication of food animals has played fairly significant roles in enabling the emergence of permanent heritable hierarchies. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the other thing I want to um, add into this is that even though we are talking about an interspecies relationship, um, I do think we need to understand domination of animals as a social question. Mm -hmm. um, it's a product of how our society is organized, mm -hmm. um, its modes of production and exchange, um, the basics of how we collectively determine to meet human needs. Um, and as with all things that relate to the ever mutable structure of human societies, this means it's something that we could very well do differently. Um, I mean, my my basic position is I don't I don't think that um, mass slaughter of beings can be reconciled with um, ecological ethics of complementarity. Um, and you know, when we're talking about animal agriculture, um, we're really not even talking about the ecological relationship of predator and prey. Mm -hmm. um, something that many indigenous peoples and all of our ancestors have been a part of, mm -hmm. um, but rather the much more recent development, um, at least on you know the scale of species history that we've been talking about, of of a kind of social domination um, that is part of our relationship to farmed animals, um, mm -hmm. and you know this is well, a lot of the different kinds of, of hierarchies um, that we talk about, like are sunk really deep into how we relate to each other and the world around us and unwrapping them in, involves like sometimes pretty dramatic changes in how um, in how we relate to each other and other living things. Um, and, and I don't think the animal question is really any different there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really well said. I think I think it's a really really important central question. It is for me. I, I dedicated over twenty years of my own research looking at agribusiness, and my book Foods, Farms, and Solidarity was really looking at the emergence of um, biotech, sort of taking over agriculture around the planet. Um, but more broadly, the book is about agribusiness um, and what that does to people, animals, and the whole planet. And I, I'm, for me, it's, it's, it's kind of something I feel very strongly about. Um, but I think that, you know, the term speciesism is sort of like the term anthropocentrism. And on the surface, they seem like really great concepts. Like, yeah. But when we realize and think about how, as a species, we are so divided by social hierarchies that are institutionalized, that if the 99% of our species is, are treated like animals um, and are trafficked and exploited and, um, you know, oppressed, we're mm -hmm. not really in a human-centered society at all. We're not mm -hmm. really a human species-centered. So that, that the term, while it's entirely well-meaning, um, it's a, for me, it, it falls a little off the, the target um, because it doesn't, make us realize how it's it's institutions that really oppress one you know within within our species itself um you know not all humans are having a great time dominating you know nature most of humanity mm -hmm. is being dominated um but the, the other question about you know practice um in the form of technology and bookshin writes a lot about um technology whether it's food production animal husbandry, weird word, um, um, he would say, let's look at the social matrix of technology. And he says that every practice that we have, technological practice, whether it's food production of any kind, um, it's always within a political social matrix where people have are limited or constrained by how much political, economic, and moral or ethical um, power they have. And so, Bookshin would never have said, for instance, and, and I wouldn't say, here's a party line on here's what how we have to make our food and whether we eat meat or we don't. 
rather, you know, I made this little diagram here, which is kind of the, the five principles of social ecology that I find to be useful. And they're direct democracy, social justice, ecology, moral economy, and non-hierarchy. And the question be, say you were living in a directly democratic society and you could sit together and say, okay, how are we gonna do food production? And what would, what would result is we'd have to have a conversation about, for instance, in the question of animals, how do we rationalize? How do we justify? How do we make ethical statements about what would constitute an ethical and humane relationship with animals that was accountable to our ecological values. And if our ecological values means that we have to play a constructive role in the rest with the rest of the um, um, non-human world, that's we're accountable to that. But we're also in a moral economy where the production demands would be really different. So in in a not in a, in a moral economy, you wouldn't have industrial agriculture, I hope. You wouldn't have food as commodity. And I think how we ended up in the mess that we're in right now, and, and to me, I feel physical pain when I look at, um, I literally can't even look at um, documentaries where I see what happens to cows and chickens and how they are, um, you know, literally tortured. Um, during their brief lives and then killed in such a unethical and inhumane way. And mm -hmm. I emphasize the word humane because humanity has to dip into its own empathy and feel for other animals and to factor that into thinking about how do we want to relate to them. But again, these would not be policies that we can say in the abstract. They have to be conversations that happen among people who are empowered to make decisions about Food production and it's really possible that i could go live in a community where people like we're vegetarians that's mm -hmm. it <laughs> you know or we're you know vegans who do a little bit of hunting or you know we're 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 people who have a little bit of livestock because it's the their poop is good for the soil and their grazing is good for the land etc so i think instead of having you know a take on it that's sort of like a sociological take it's what are the principles that would guide us in making decisions about our food source and what how do we get to creating the kind of economy and political structure where we'd be empowered to have not just decision not just discussion but decision policy making power and that's mm -hmm. part of the ecological um, revolution Absolutely. Yeah, that was absolutely beautifully said. Um, I'm glad that you brought up the idea of like speciesism and, you know, not all people uh, being treated equally or certain people being animalized in our society. Um, I always shout out Afco's work, Afroism, who talks about the links between um, like white supremacy and animalizing um, people. Uh, within our society. Um, and uh, yeah, I completely agree in, in terms of like uh, Mason, you brought up, it's it's not the same as this kind of predator prey relationship um, or even a, a relationship of reciprocity in consuming animals like you see in, you know, many indigenous um, societies. Uh, it is this kind of, you know, mass commodification of sentient animal bodies and then the manipulation of their bodies to suit our needs, which I think probably has no place in the in the social ecological future. Um, but as you said, yeah, there are many different, um, many different relationships that we can think about having um, with non human animals um, in the future that would not be uh, commodified and that, you know, might not look exactly like, uh, you know, what some some vegans uh, think about uh, the future looking like where like no animals are, you know, uh, have symbiotic relationships with humans in any way. Um, so uh, real politics says it seems as though the central domination is the psychosocial relationship with the land itself, not just social domination as hierarchies arose from social problems in the Neolithic revolution. Um, I'm not sure if you have any comment on that or um, I'm not, that's right. Quite, quite understand that. I, I do understand that. That was, um, I think folks who are more versed in kind of deep ecological theory, um, will often kind of look at the Neolithic. Well, the, the question always is, it's the, 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 the question of when did humans fall? You know, mm -hmm. it's called prelapsarian thinking. When did humans fall from grace? Was it when they started 
yeah. speaking, using language? Was it when we started using tools? It was when we started agriculture? Is it when we started the Industrial Revolution? Was it back in the Neolithic when we started using very, you know, relatively crude kind of tools? Um, and I think that kind of thinking is not all that productive in the end. I think that um, because sometimes people get overly focused on technology and thinking we fell when we had a, when we started to really embrace a certain kind of technology. It's when we started to the, the printing press or, or again, you know. And I think when we do that, we fit, we start to take on a kind of techno determinism where we think that the technologies are sort of driving society, which in some ways, technologies can take on a life of their own. So we're seeing right now with social media, uh, misinformation, <laughs> fascism, um, but social, but technologies always have a, a economic and political and cultural ground. And I think that it's really more important um, and more helpful, I think more, Uh, is, is Hyatt frozen for everyone or just me? Yeah, she's frozen. Oh no. <laughs> okay. Um, hopefully she's able to come back. Um, I'll just say here, uh, Destin D says, perhaps our relationship with cats is instructive. The value of felines to coast and farming communities is clear, but they are neighbors. Yeah. I think that's a really great point. Um, because, you know, obviously there are, really productive relationships that can exist between species that are that are mutually beneficial mm -hmm. um and oftentimes that's used to like rationalize um um slaughter and and meat production um you know like they're serving this important function that needs to happen anyway um but of course it's perfectly possible to have those relationships um not involve killing each other Mm -hmm. Oh no, we lost Haya completely. Oh no, I I did that on purpose because I thought maybe okay. I could, if I added, <laughs> it's not working with the with the adding back. <laughs> so hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully that works out. Oh, maybe she'll come back in. Um, yeah. Anyway, that was that was really well said. Um, so uh, maybe let's move on to the creative ideation section. So I thought we could talk about what a vision of a social ecological future could look like. Um, well, I think I think it looked very different in lots of different places. Um, I think the one of the central slogans of the Zapatistas um, is quite instructive here, which is a world where many worlds fit. Um, I, I, but I think um, you know the kinds of ways in which um, direct democracy and providing for the needs of all people can um, manifest in um, different contexts is gonna is gonna vary pretty dramatically. Um, but the the point is that everyone um, has an equal voice in shaping what that looks like um, for for their own um, their own community. Um, mm -hmm. I think lots of the um, lots of I think this this it gets more um, easy to think through. Um, when we ground it in the concrete and um, and even in our present circumstance. Um, what, are, what are the things about um, our present social relations that are um, destructive or um, exploitative? Um, and what are kind of like the processes that we could transform or transition them um, into something else? Um, I think, you know, if, if you're uh, imagining just the um, the level of a neighborhood, um, you know, at least in the United States, um, for most people, um, that's even an arena of uh, isolation. Um, you know, we have kind of um, revolutionized society to be totally organized around um, nuclear families existing in um, single family homes that um, are are even isolated in our um, primary modes of um, transportation. Um, and so I think I think kind of like a foundational part of building a social ecological future would be 
um, creating political space for people who do live in proximity together um, to discuss like what other kinds of um, ways they could organize their built environment and their um, immediate ways of interacting with other people. Um, one, one example that, um, like one way of doing this that, um, oh, she's back. <laughs> sorry, we lost you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Here's my computer. It wasn't even a battery thing. It just died. I'm so sorry. Oh, Keep talking okay. to get a better picture. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, but you know, on, on the neighborhood level, I think this this means um, you know the the need to construct new new space that is social, that is public, um, you know, for for eating, for um, discussing, um, for assembling. Um, one of the things that um, I got to experience for a couple of years of my life was um, a a food co-op where. You know, I had one shift a week um, with you know, six or seven other people cooking for 50 of us um, and, you know, then had, you know, basically unlimited food for every every other meal that I would want because other people had those shifts. And I just think about how much more time I spend feeding myself now than I did then, um, as well as like how isolated and um, often unvaried, it ends up being, um, those are the kinds of spaces, institutions that we could create that kind of just like totally transform the basics of daily life around um, sharing and, and common space and, and things of that nature. Um, but that all comes back to kind of like the democratization of, of the political realm. We can't make that happen if we don't have the power to implement it. Um, and um, and that means um, organizing and, and wielding that democratic power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Haya, we were just talking about what a vision of a social ecological future could look like. Wow. Um, I'm not sure if you wanted to weigh in on that. Sure, I also think it was, there's, whenever I've had like weird technological things happen, it's when I'm talking about technology. It was, I laugh because <laughs> I'm literally talking about technology and how they don't deter things, <laughs> literally. <laughs> so, um, you know, what's so beautiful to me about social ecology is that it's a utopian perspective and it's one that is filled with hope and um, and, and not to sort of airy fairy hope, but hope grounded in, in real, in, in, in real things, in real people, in real places. Um, to me, uh, an ecological future, or, or or the good society, it's it's happening in little places all around the world. You know, like right now, mm -hmm. I'm incredibly inspired by what um, Kurds are doing in Rojava to mm -hmm. create society based on principles of feminism and ecology and direct democracy. Um, and to me, the good society is one where people can share a common set of principles and create a program together, a charter, a constitution, um, and can live together in an accountable way to each other and figure out how to become fully human. And to me, Again, to be fully human means to be fully humane, and that means the humane treatment of other animals and the rest of the planet. Um, but it, what's beautiful to me about Bookshin's utop utopian vision is it's not singular. It's as diverse and multiple as are all the people and cultures around the world, and that we have no idea, you know, what we could bloom into and what we could become if we could just have um, create the proper scale, the proper um, economy and the proper um, political sphere. If we could do that um, and the proper ecological technologies, you know, I think we could have a really beautiful world. And I, I see it, you know, Murray was such a beautiful speaker and I got to for 22, you know, long programs of summers a year and then we were very good friends. So. 
I got to hear him when he would talk about, you know, revolution and what the good society was, I could see it, you know, mm -hmm. and I could feel it kind of, it was, it was palpable. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no blueprint. And I, and I love that about social ecology. It's not a, a specific program. It's a set of principles that give people in the context of, of a popular assembly, um, a way to have some common alignment to make decisions about their everyday lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that there's so much that we could be doing in this moment, especially with with technology, right? Um, you know, obviously we need to change our relationship to technology um, under capitalism, but I think there's so many ways that, um, you know, even now we could start making a lot more intentional communities. And as you said, Mason, start sharing a lot of, um, you know, the the labor or the menial tasks. We can, there's a lot of ways we can think about meeting each other's needs in, you know, non-commodified ways. So kind of outside of the bounds of capital, um, creating more kind of institutions for direct democracy within our neighborhoods and our communities. Um, you know, thinking about ways to live in greater reciprocity in the ecosystems that we inhabit, right? There's just, I think there's so many things that we could be doing right now to kind of um, build that future and kind of, uh, I'm gonna make a video about this, but this idea of like living the revolution into being um, in terms of like living a new mode of production into being um, such that we, make, you know, the state and capital as irrelevant as possible to like the daily goings on um, to our lives. Um, so I think, yeah, there's just, um, it, it's, I think it's really important to do this kind of creative ideation and to think about the possibilities. Um, Cause you know, our, our creativity has been so co-opted by capital. It's really hard to imagine the end of capitalism as everyone always says, um, but I think we need to try, <laughs> you know, um, so that we can start thinking about how we, how we move forward in our communities. Um, so that speaks to the next question about what are some potential paths forwards? I know you said there's absolutely no, no blueprint, um, but what could a political ecological political program look like? And um, what do you think some of the, the steps that we can start taking in communities to start building these things out? Me? Yeah. Um, if you have some thoughts, go for it. <laughs> I have some thoughts. Um, you know, I think that the green movement in the U.S. I was I was part of the group that started the green movement that unfortunately became a green party. It was not supposed to become an electoral um, party. The green movement had ten key principles, and I could probably list them all. You could probably guess what they are, actually. You know. Um, it was definitely anti-racism, feminism, ecology, ecological technology, um, direct democracy. Um, I could think of five more, but basically, you know, the program isn't that hard. I mean, you know, like the, in Rojava, they've gotten it down to three principles. I have five. It's not that it's, it's, it's kind of. I like to call it kindergarten logic. Like all the things that we teach children to do in preschool or kindergarten is kind of, are, those are kind of the principles that you want in your, in your society. Treat others with respect, right? No hierarchy, share things, right? Um, treat, you know, objects with respect, be nice to nature. I mean, it's, it's really literally, it's kindergarten logic. And what's amazing is how, to what ex to what extent and and the uh, the great efforts have been taken among the one percent of humanity to distort us and to pull us away from kindergarten logic, which is again what you hear if you go to a church on a Sunday, if it's you know, or a shul or a mosque, you know, treat people as if they are you know your brother or sister. Be good, do good. Um, but you know, I can say that it my in my own um political life the the closest i ever came and it was a while ago to having you know a political project that really spoke to a community in a really powerful way was in the 80s i was part of the burlington greens and and ironically we were fighting against Bernie, um against um bernie sanders and his <laughs> progressive coalition and we, you know, we used to say, you're a social democrat, you're not a real socialist. And it's funny because the end of the morning is a social democrat. It's funny. Um, 
and you know he was he was a socialist and um <laughs> and we were like no you're not you're a fake socialist and we were the anarchists and uh, <laughs> six years i was part of this group where we put forth our 10-pronged program that was the left green program and again the central ones were moral economy direct democracy feminism anti-racism um ecology and eco-technology um and what we would do is we would take a particular issue and show how the um, non-ecological and capitalist and state of society had brought us to where we were and how a social ecology program would bring us to where we wanted to go. So the main issue we looked at was the wetlands in Burlington. And this campaign went on for six years. Bernie wanted to, um, it was a bunch of, land that was on the waterfront of Burlington and if you've ever been to Burlington, Vermont, but it was not developed. And Bernie wanted to bring in developers to bring jobs and construction and hotels and, you know, and <laughs> we were like, and, and our position was, um, those jobs are gonna be temporary. And um, what you're gonna have is ecological devastation of these wetlands that were lands to nesting and migrating birds and a whole bunch of different kinds of animals that were living in what Brookston called eco-communities, in these wetland eco-communities. But it was also public space that people could enjoy. And so our, our um, proposal was to turn it into a boardwalk and a park, part of it, um, and give people access to the lake and to have like a, a boat, a boat, what was it called? a place where you could go and rent a boat. <laughs> um, and um, and then part would be a wetland preserve. And if you go to Burlington right now, you can go down to the waterfront and I go, at least I try once a year to go to the waterfront and hang out. And it is a publicly um, enjoyed owned piece of land in Burlington that really, that, that was created by the Burlington Greens despite Bernie Sanders. There are no luxury condos, no luxury hotels that, that Bernie wanted to, to build. And what was amazing is that we were advancing not just this single issue of the waterfront, but the waterfront became a symbol and a way to illustrate our broadest program and all of our values. So that every time we came to a city council meeting, every time we came to any kind of forum, they knew, okay, here's the social ecologist. They're going to be a broken record for moral economy and, and they're gonna be broken, broken record for direct democracy and ecology. And, and so what happened was over time, people understood our program. They understood our vision and they got curious and started reading you know, work by social ecologists and started coming to our meetings. And so um, the, there's a chapter in my book, The Ecology of Everyday Life, where I sort of talk about how do you take a social movement issue and sort of pull out of it your broadest revolutionary vision. So you are doing both um, the social rework and the political envisioning at the same time. And I'll just say also, you know, you just um, really aptly pointed to this idea of prefigurative politics that you want, that what we're doing now is relevant and it's inspiring and it's consistent and aligned with our vision of how we wanna live in the future. So we're prefiguring, we're also creating ourselves, you know, and, and Bookchin had this lovely saying, which is that every revolution is an educational project that when we're in a, in a food co-op or if we're in a whatever kind of co-op, those aren't just ways to get great, you know, affordable um, items. It's that we're socialized. You know, I, in my 20s and 30s, I was, I cannot count how many co-ops I was part of, but I was in, I was in a co-op that was a battered woman's shelter. I was in a co-op that was a rape crisis shelter, um, center. I was in a co-op that was a food co-op. I was in a, um, actually in a bike co-op. And I lived in a in cooperative housing and I learned how to be a social um, person who would be the person living in that society. So these these experiences are little schools. They're you know not just a way to get through this this difficult society we live in, but it's also a way to 
turn ourselves in, into the kinds of people that will have the sensibility, um, the kinds of mutualistic sensibilities that we want to have in the good society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah, love I that. Like, oh, sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, Mason, yeah. can you say something? Uh, yeah, um, I, I also have an answer to this question, um, which I think I would put more in terms of um, revolutionary political strategy. And um, I think I think one of the really important contributions um, social ecology has made to radical political thought um, is in um, framing social transformation um, in terms of uh, in terms of dual power um, and um, for. Um, those who might not be familiar, the, the idea of dual power comes from the Russian Revolution, um, where after the Tsar had been overthrown, um, these uh, participatory democratic councils of regular workers sprung up all across the country. Um, and the government that replaced the Tsar um, didn't really have much in the way of real political power. It didn't have a whole lot of legitimacy um, because it was not elected. Um, and ordinary people were participating in forms of politics that they had real direct control over um, and began to be able to understand themselves as uh, active political subjects with a um, you know, degree of sovereignty over the conditions of their own lives. Um, and so the idea of dual power is that as a result of this, there became two poles of power in society that um, are kind of competing for um, uh, legitimacy in a, in a general sense. Um, and if we can create the conditions in which we have built up the political infrastructure of directly democratic self-governance, um, you know, the, the existing political order um, can be seen as obsolete and tossed aside, um, overthrown and replaced by um, the new systems of participatory direct democracy that we ourselves have organized and created. Um, I think that's, you know, an enormous task of, um, of, of, of a lifetime to, to build and create, but it has been done repeatedly in the past and can be um, can be achieved for ourselves again. Um, I think it's really crucial to ground these um, institutions of self-governance in people's like real material interests, not just the abstract idea that democracy is good and we should act as if we have it, um, because you know that that really that really struggles to bring people in, you know, who are working class, who have children, um, who have like real obligations in their lives um, that are difficult to set aside. Um, so I think most of the really effective organizing that, you know, has this revolutionary political vision is grounded in the sense that the things that we are building um, at the community level um, that will kind of be the building blocks of a future democratic society um, are you know, rooted in um, struggles that have real impacts on people's lives. Like, um, you know, the, the autonomous tenants movement in, uh, in the US um, has been, had some really exciting experiments of um, organizing working class people around um, struggles over rent and housing. Um, and those institutions of of those vehicles of struggle can um, quite readily morph into institutions of self-government. Um, you know, I think one one an analogy for this is is like the syndicalist conception of unionism and labor struggle. Um, you know, the, the the conventional idea of unions is um, you organize a union in order to get better circumstances out of your present relationship to the boss. To get better wages or working conditions. Um, it's something that like is exists within um, the capitalist social order. It's just softening its edges. Um, 
but how syndicalists thought of it is the union is not just a vehicle for extracting concessions. Um, it can be that in the here and now, but it's also the institution that can replace the wage relationship that um, you know, if we if we are powerful enough on the shop floor, we don't need the boss at all. We can run this shit together. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that kind of basic approach to building vehicles for struggle um, and scaling them uh, together um, to you know constitute a real dual power uh, against the existing order um, is something that can um, be done on all sorts of fronts and aspects of our lives. Um, and I, th I think that's kind of the pathway towards um, democratizing society is this broader mm -hmm. uh, dual power framework. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that you, sorry. Yeah, I love that you brought that up because um, it ties into my my last question here. Um, but I really do think that's you know the the most important thing that we can be doing right now. And I think that we're not going to have a successful revolution if we don't actually adequately build up those mechanisms of dual power. Um, so we need to actually have. We, we need to live the new mode of, of production into being um, because, you know, a lot of people talk about like they'll just kind of jump to this idea of like, well, how are we going to defend the revolution? How are we going to do this? Or, um, you know, we need to seize the state first and then try to force these relations into being. Um, and that's going about it a really, really difficult way. Right. You're trying to like completely recreate society kind of from the outside in, meaning you're going to have to come up with um, basically a blueprint of how you want to do this and then just like put that into being. Um, and then just expect people to know how to do that and to know how to live these very radically different social relations kind of like that, right? So I just, I feel like for any kind of revolution to be successful, we have to actually go out there and live those relations into being. Um, and uh, and yeah, I just think that social ecology is really great in that way because that's exactly kind of the program that it's um, it's advocating for. Um, so I'd love to hear more actually, Mason, about how you're organizing um, direct democracy in your neighborhood. Um, but uh, Real Politics says, I guess what I'm saying is that it seems like flattening hierarchy needs to include how society relates to land and the me mentality of othering nature, i.e. a land ethic as part of social justice, not through social justice. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's what we're talking about, right? Yeah. Um, I think I think something I would add to what Haya responded to this earlier is that the way that we relate to land is not merely like uh, a humans to nature relationship. It's something that is shaped by and constituted by social relations of the human society. Um, I mean, like it's kind of how we were talking about private property before. The idea of private property is a kind of relationship to the land, um, but it is actually brought into being and constituted by um, you know these hierarchical social relationships within human society. Um, and so like we need to we need to be able to transform human society in order to create a new land ethic. Um, and um, I think you know lots of there's there's lots of existing ways of relating to the land. We don't need to um, invent this whole cloth. Um, but they kind of they rest on um, a totally different kind of society to be able to exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a totally different ontology, right? Um, but I think that's what we were talking about a bit before in terms of like Robin Wall Kimmerer or different like indigenous ontologies and, and, and different um, ways of understanding ourselves and understanding the land and understanding our relationship to it. Um, so absolutely, that's, you know, <laughs> that's a, a huge part of it. Um, so, oh yeah, so Mason, um, I just wanted to ask about your work in um, organizing direct democracy in your neighborhood. Uh, Cause I think that's obviously an important way or an important um, project in order to start building that dual power. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. I mean, I don't want to present this as kind of like the definitive example of how this works because um, you know, we're learning as we go and lots of other uh, revolutionary organizations are much farther down down the line, even in in this country, in um, you know developing kind of locally rooted uh, dual power. But um, 
it's just some some social background for the city of Detroit um, is that going back at least to before World War II, um, a big part of the social landscape in the city has been this institution called the Block Club, um, which is kind of like a hyper local neighbor organization. Um, so named because it was like literally an organization of the people who live on a single block. Um, these have played like all tons of different social roles um, for white neighborhoods um, until the 70s. They mostly functioned as um, vehicles of racial exclusion, um, um, but you know have have played a you know, really big part of um, of black social history in, in the city as well. Um, and so this is, you know, an institution that even as it has eroded um, in recent decades with the um, depopulation of the city um, and uh, deindustrialization um, is something that basically everyone who lives in Detroit knows about. Um, it's kind of um, part of their, um, it's like a political reference point um, for regular people. So when you, when you talk about organizing block clubs, um, it is not something wildly out of left field. Um, like, you know, saying we need to organize neighborhood Soviets or the, you know, the direct democracy communes or something. Um, it has, it has a foothold in people's like existing, um, political life. Um, so what, uh, we've been doing in my neighborhood for the past um, about four years or so is resuscitating um, our community's block club um, because you know we live in quite a, a blighted area of the city. There's so many more, so many fewer people who live there than did even 20 years ago. Um, it wasn't really realistic to limit it to a single block. Um, you know, we're talking about like maybe uh 15 total people um so we kind of like set it up on a wider geographic area um but you know basically just took the approach that you know we're kind of a uh a horizontal um organization anyone who lives here can like come and have a voice in in what we do um and began using that as a a vehicle for um addressing like immediate needs and, and problems in the neighborhood. Um, first and most obvious for us was um, was illegal dumping. Um, so like contractors from the suburbs or other parts of the city or whatever will like literally pull up and dump all their construction waste on an empty lot um, in the neighborhood, usually in the middle of night, but sometimes very shamelessly in broad daylight. Um, and so Again, organizing like community cleanups, um, putting up physical barriers to make it more difficult for them, um, thing, things of that nature, um, which are kind of things, it was like participatory activities that anyone could take part in. It was very obvious to everyone participating, like what the immediate impact of your involvement is on um, you know, the conditions of our community. Um, but you know, in building that kind of like initial vehicle for collective action, let us pull off a whole bunch of other stuff. So um, back in uh, just a little over a year ago, um, the um, the city's development uh, plan development department um, tried to put a a new auto parts factory on the site of our. Um, our rec center, which had been shut down and then was like mysteriously burned um, and demolished. Um, and they were doing so with um, trying to eliminate um, all possibilities for community input on the project, um, kind of like choking off our, our opportunities to secure like um, community benefits in the form of um, environmental protections from the pollution, um, you know, try to get guarantees for um, local hiring and things like that. Um, so what we did was we just organized the neighborhood to 
um, to sh obstruct, to shut down the project, um, to make sure that they couldn't, um, you know, bypass any kind of community input on it. Um, and, um, you know, had dozens of people calling the city council, things like that, um, and to succeed um, in shutting it down. And it was really important as kind of like a galvanizing thing for the organization because the city had like meetings of five to 10 people. Um, and through this, we ended up having like community assemblies more on the order of 20 to 30. Um, our capacity really increased as a result of this campaign. And then that brought us right into um, the pandemic where we kind of had to shift course and um, you know, some of our members led this effort to um, do um, a mutual aid program for, for food for people, mostly focused on like elderly folks who weren't able to safely go to the grocery store, you know, getting, collecting donations, doing drop offs, people's porches, um, things of that nature. Um, we started a community garden in the spring um, and you know, had you know, basically like used that to supplement our um, mutual aid program and also just um, got a whole bunch of uh, fresh produce for everyone participating. And we've been, um, there's like two, two or three um, kind of big projects that I'm really excited for. They're coming together for this coming year. Um, this is, this is the main reason why I'm really hoping to get uh, the vaccine rollout going well, because um, it, it all kind of depends on that. But um, one of our neighbors bought an abandoned house um, across the street from us that we've been renovating to turn into sort of community house. Um, mm. It's like a public space for a couple for meetings and for, um, for like our tool library that we've been building kind of like, you know, the, the wrong boys library socialism, um, library of stuff um, approach. Um, and um, we, we are also trying to uh, put together a time bank for the neighborhood mm -hmm. that would uh, basically allow us to compensate people for their volunteer time to the organization um, and also kind of like strengthen ties between people um, uh, locally. Um, a time bank is basically uh, a means of exchange where the currency is time. Um, you earn hours by doing stuff for other people um, and you can spend them by asking people to um, do stuff for you and it ensures that like everyone's time is is equal regardless of you know how marketable their their various skills are. Um, and then lastly, we've been part of like this emerging coalition of other block clubs and community organizations um, in our area um, that has been uh, basically like securing, community benefits agreements with um, other uh, like companies that are trying to set up shop um, where basically they'll, they'll, you know, make commitments to us for local hiring and, um, and also like donate money to our work um, in exchange for us, like being cool with them coming here. Um, and so that coalition has kind of like begun to, lay the groundwork for setting up a, a local federation of block clubs that could have like larger uh, people's assemblies on a recurring basis to decide how we want to allocate um, these, this money that we've raised collectively um, and kind of do, um, you know, engage in a kind of local politics of, um, of neighborhood self-government um, to kind of deciding what to do with shared resources and, um, building things that we can um, work on collectively. Um, and so I'm, I'm part of a, kind of like more of a cadre organization in Detroit called Detroit Build and Fight that is um, trying to like focus on um, uh, training up people to be organizers in these kinds of um, uh, mass organizations like um, block clubs and tenant unions and um, that, but but it's citywide, so trying to um, try to create some of the connective tissue between block clubs around the city, um, with the eventual goal of kind of scaling these into um, a directly democratic uh, dual power in the city of Detroit. Um, this is all like very much in embryonic stages, um, but I think I think there's kind of like 
a fairly clear trajectory of organizational development um, and kind of like building the base of, of regular people participating in, um, you know, their, their own self-government at the local level and in uh, political struggle more broadly. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. That is so just really inspiring. I, I love to hear about all of that work. I love the concept of time banking. I think that's just really wonderful um, and a really wonderful, wonderful way forward. So yeah, thank you for sharing um, yeah. all of that work. I think that will be really inspiring for a lot of people thinking about kind of like organizing their own communities. Um, so I have one last question and I can only, I only have like about 10, 10 more minutes that I can stay on stream because uh, I have another meeting after. Um, but so I'll ask this question and then if anyone else has other questions from the chat, um, we can uh, field those uh, until I do have to go. Um, but so the last question was kind of around this idea of dual power and um, just, I think this is a very like online left kind of a phenomenon, but just it's it seems to be very difficult to talk about building du- dual power or talk about this kind of approach of like building up the new society in the shell of the old, because people will just automatically jump to like, well, how are you going to defend the revolution? Or like, you know, no, we can't do it that way. We have to get armed and like storm that capital or, you know, whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, so, but I think, you know, you talked about the Kurds in Rojava and I think, you know, they're, they're a great example. Like they're super inspiring, um, but they've also had to fight off, right. Um, uh, the state, um, various states, uh, you know, and different forces. Um, so I guess, you know, what are your thoughts on that in terms of, I, I mean, my thought is that like, I think we should maybe just focus on building something up worthy of defense before we start jumping to to that but uh but what are your thoughts on that i could speak to that um generally speaking social ecology is a non-insurrectionary um approach to revolution Mm -hmm. and takes a dual power strategy Mm -hmm. um but at least as somebody living in the united states i'm not in the situation of kurds living in northern syria so Mm -hmm. I mean, no judgment whatsoever. Um, in, in fact, I, I, am, I admire and I applaud that they are literally fighting for their lives while they're trying to create a utopian society. It's, mm-hmm. it's kind of unbelievable and I think historically unprecedented. Um, but as somebody living in the United States, um, how I understand dual power and how to wrest political power um, is to do the kinds of things that Mason's talking about, going in and building real relationships in your community, creating or institutions that where people get to literally have that experience of having some power and making some decision and making some policy, but also to, to, to do that in a political zone. And um, Bookshin first called this Um, libertarian municipalism, and then he's changed it to be communalism. And what that meant was taking, going into existing legal political forums on the municipal level, not above the municipal level, because then you hit the state, which at least to most social ecologists is um, not a legitimate um, political structure, but on the municipal level, neighborhood councils, city planning boards, city councils, um, but going to those forums, and I've done a lot of this with different groups that I've been part of over the decades. Um, I did it the, was most involved in, when I was in Burlington. Um, but going in as communalists, and here's our program, and here's the issues that we're dealing with. But literally going in knowing that you're going to be that minority, that visible minority in that political um, assembly, and that through con- through conversation and through debate and through persuasion um, and argumentation, respectful, of course, slowly over time, people seeing your time and your work and your vision that you start to move from the majority minority into hopefully the majority. And so that when you, when your program wins an election, say you're doing, there's an election for city planning board or ward assembly, Head um, that what you're who you're rate who you're putting forth um, to be elected is not a person but a program, um, and in our case you, we might have picked by lot literally, 
or volunteer who wants to be the delegate, not the representative of the group that had no decision-making power on their own, um, put a delegate out. If they won, everybody knew that they'd be voting in the program, not the individual. Um, and that to me is a kind of political dual power organizing that really has remains to be done on a really broad scale um, anywhere really. Um, and I think in every city of every town um, across this country in Canada and on, throughout the world, people could start to create political dual power situations. And the idea of dual power for how I understand it is to create what's called a contest of legitimacy where people stand back and they look at these dual forms of power. One in, the, in case of going into a political popular assembly, looking at the people who are advancing a directly democratic model versus an electoral model where the electorate elected a first person has decision-making power over other people. And people literally see that contest between those two models and they choose, oh, hopefully they would choose, I choose to, to be in a directly democratic um, political process rather than a representational one. Mm -hmm. um, and now I choose to do, to create a confederation of directly democratic cities, towns, and villages, rather than to have the next level of um, political organization be the state. So you go from the municipal municipal level to the confederal level, rather than from the municipal level to the state. And in that way, we dual power our way from one within political structures of one society into political powers of another society. That's the one we want to be living in. And I don't see these two dual power strategies of being incompatible. I think they're intensely complementary. So I could see doing these kinds of inhabiting and occupying and being part of municipal assemblies that are political in nature, that are also part of doing, that are acting in a complementary way with the kinds of social organizing in the social, social realm that, social realm that um, Mason is describing so beautifully and that's so inspiring. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, I, I definitely um, view need for a bit more of a confrontational approach to the state. Um, but I, I think I very much agree with Hyde that like this is, um, uh, this is not like an abstract truth of how um, political change takes place. It is um, conditional on um, one's local circumstances. And I think that's one of the really interesting things about local government in the U.S. is how dramatically it varies um, from, from place to place. Like the basic political structures of, of local government um, are, are, so, um, are, are so varied. Um, like in, in, in Detroit, for example, if we wanted to um, basically draft a new city charter and organize, reorganize everything about the structure of government, we wouldn't have to elect anyone to city council. Um, there's there's a whole separate process for um, having an election to um, appoint a charter committee and then electing people to that charter committee with like a particular program. Um, we could dodge like actual elected officials entirely if we wanted to. Um, but I I think I think that you know when Haya talks about like the the contest of legitimacy and like the creating the possibility for people to to choose to um, participate in a different um, system of government. I think we have to keep in mind that like what it would require politically for that choice to have any power behind it. Um, and I think oftentimes that entails um, confrontation with, with the state as it exists. Um, Absolutely. I'm not saying, I'm not, I mean, I think, you know, this is like the, the question about what happens when you get what you ask for? You know, this is when I would, when I teach social ecology, this is always one of the most central and legitimate questions. What happens when the, there is a true contest? Say you got what you wanted and there's there's this confederation of self-governing cities, towns and villages around the, the US. At some point, the, the, the state will come after you. Yeah. Absolutely. And that is when the revolutionary kind of tipping point happens. And the hope is that as you, as the dual power um, revolutionary process unfolds, that 
more and more people come on board so that it has more social authority from broader and broader sectors of society. And there always is that tipping point. Will you and have I think undermining that like political legitimacy of the state also entails in very concrete ways weakening its capacity for violence. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always begging people to read Hannah Arendt's On Violence about this um, because I think it's a very useful framing tool for conceptualizing um, those revolutionary tipping points and how um, and how they can begin. Um, I do also think that um, when it comes to defending revolutionary projects, there's not really any escaping the need for organized armed defense. Um, and Rojava is definitely not alone historically in having to had to defend itself against violent reaction. Um, you know, you can look at like 19, the 1905 Russian Revolution. They're facing the Black Hundreds, um, the Fry Corps, and the German Revolution. Uh, much more recently, you know, in Chiapas, the the Mexican federal government was arming paramilitaries um, that carried out like these horrific massacres um, of you know of, like of peaceful unarmed people um, and 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 so many more. I don't think we have to think very hard have a very clear idea who our equivalents would be if we succeeded in creating a revolutionary dual power in our own communities. Um, they're, they're on national news right now. Um, and, but I, I think, I think like to your point, Maxie, that like people who talk about um, uh, like armed community defense are putting the cart before the horse. I think it's the critical thing is is placing control of the means of violence firmly in the hands of the direct democracy of the assembly. Um, you know, you need to have uh, systems of um, collective self government that um, are capable of of organizing these and ensuring that um, they do not morph into a new state. Um, that could like impose the will of some kind of new minority ruling class. And I think a lot of like revolutionary projects have failed in this regard because the um, units of of like proletarian defense or whatever um, have been organized within the party, um, you know, which is kind of like becomes to uh, begin to be a seed of a new state um, that uh, might defend the assemblies one day and um, go against them the next. I think it's really crucial to have direct democracy be in the saddle when it comes to um, when it comes to community defense and for those units themselves to be yeah. internally democratic. Um, one really exciting and illustrative example of how this can look in practice um, is in the indigenous uh, Mexican municipality of Chiron um, in Michoacan. Um, so basically like back in 2011, um, they've been suffering from all kinds of, uh, well, pre 2011, I should say murders and extortions, um, because of drug cartels who had bought off all the cops and they bought off uh, all the politicians. Um, and, um, also like a ton of illegal logging that was deforesting the area. Um, so the people of Sharon staged this local uprising in 2011 where they formed new community defense units. They kicked out all the loggers, all the cartels. They kicked out all of the cops and the corrupt politicians um, and then abolished their representative government in favor of an assembly democracy. Um, and so to ensure that the, the police and cartels couldn't come back, they adopted this double strategy of, uh, of revolutionary defense. Um, first was a legal one. Um, Mexico, you know, this is part of why this couldn't be like just transplanted into our context. Mexico actually has really um, interesting laws that allow like, especially for indigenous people, new forms of uh, local autonomy. Um, and so they got, they secured legal recognition of their new self-governing community. Um, but they also maintained these community defense units under the control of the community's assembly. Um, so they have, like, if you want to serve in these patrols, you need to be elected into those roles. And then they rotate. Um, there is no, like, permanent armed force in charge of society. Um, 
And um, I think, you know, this is something that the political thought of social ecology can be really helpful in making sense of. Um, one distinction that Bookchin drew that I found very useful is that between a government and a state. Um, like Sharon clearly has a set of institutions uh, through which it governs its affairs. Like there is a municipal government, but it isn't organized around imposing the rule of a minority over the rest of the people. It's organized as direct democracy. Um, so it's autonomous municipal institutions um, could be thought of as a government, but not a state. Um, and I think having these uh, genuinely democratic institutions of collective defense is precisely how they preserve the statelessness of their community um, mm -hmm. and secure it from uh, threats internal and external. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, yeah, that's amazing. Um, I think that's uh, really well said and kind of a, a really nuanced take on how this will unfold. I think it's important to think about like the, yeah, the conditions as well, because to me, I think that if we can, um, you know, undermine the legitimacy, especially of the in the US, right? Like US is like the seat of empire. It's like the seat of global capital. And I think um, for a lot of other revolutions um, happening around the world, they have to, um, you know, always keep, you know, uh, be conscious of the fact that, you know, they're, they're going to be attacked and probably by the US or the CIA or whatever. Um, but if we can make that some kind of a, a revolution here where we're actually like building up that dual power, um, undermining the, the legitimate legitimacy of the state um, and then being able to defend that. Uh, I think that really like opens things up for the whole rest of the world. Um, so yeah, I would love to keep talking about this because I think this is so interesting, but I have to go because I have a, a meeting <laughs> with a supervisor. Um, but I just want to thank you both so much for coming on the show and for sharing all of this with all of us. Um, would you like to maybe shout out uh, where people can find you and your work before, before we go? Uh, yeah. Um, so we have a website where you can sign up for like online courses and um, just get in touch, things of that nature. Um, that's, oh boy. Social-ecology.org. Great. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, we also have, you know, some active social media pages. If you just search for Institute for Social Ecology, you'll um, find you find them all. You can, we if you go to the ISC website, you can join um, a listserv called ISC Discuss, which is really fun to see what different social ecologists around the world are doing, what they're reading, what they're thinking about. Um, as Mason said, we have classes. Um, I'm gonna be offering a class in March, which is basically gonna be kind of like an overview of the philosophy and politics of social ecology from an anti-colonial, um, anti-white supremacist perspective um, and feminist perspective. Um, and because we just started, I think we have two classes going now, but I think we'll start a new cycle in March um, but we have different lectures and different um, things. So check out our website. And um, also people who want to join the organization, there's actually ways to do that, to get into different working groups that um, help support the organization. And, and we have two, during the, um, the pandemic, we don't, are not doing these obviously, but we have two main in-person um, events a year. One is we have an intensive that's generally every June and we've kind of switched coasts. We do one on the East Coast, one on the West, and it's kind of a both for in people totally new to social ecology and also for um, people who are um, frequent flyers who want to meet, re-meet um, social ecologists and go deeper into topics. And, and again, it's called an intensive, the social ecology intensive. It hap the theme changes every year, um, the topic and the location. And this year we're having it virtually online in June. And then in August, we usually have an in-person gathering um, in Vermont, um, in Marshfield, Vermont. And usually that also has a theme um, and is, has a little more social social feel to it than the intensive is kind of wall-to-wall -wall classes. And it's also extremely fun. And there's a lot of hangout time too, but the gathering is a little bit more fun, a little, more, a little bit more social and hangouty. Um, but awesome. again, everything we're doing this year has been on Zoom because of the, mm -hmm. the virus. 
Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you. I'll link uh, the website and other places that you can find uh, Mason and Haya and their work in the description box. And just thank you again, everyone. And uh, yeah, I guess thank I'll you so end much. the broadcast now. Thank you so much for inviting us. It was really fun.